Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. If we are going to be people that are pleasing to God, we need the right spiritual perspective, a kingdom point of view. And that comes by revelation. That is simply God revealing something to us. But that revelation just doesn't happen. There are principles that we need to embrace and follow in order that we are indeed a recipient of revelation. Now, another way that theologians call this revelation is spiritual illumination. It simply points out this, that through God's revelation, it is as though God illuminates, he turns the light on, so no longer are we in spiritual darkness. And many times in the scripture, when the word of God wants to speak about those who are spiritually blind, we have examples of those who are physically blind. And when God heals them, we need to pay great attention to why. What took place in order that these individuals were healed and received their sight, saw things correctly, saw things clearly, and that means from a heavenly perspective. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 9. The book of Matthew and chapter 9. Now in this passage of scripture, we're going to see before we conclude that there is an emphasis on Israel. And the one who is blind is really Israel from a spiritual standpoint. And that is why Israel is in the situation, the position that they are in being oppressed by Rome because they are not walking in the truth of God. Instead of that, they are walking in spiritual darkness. And perhaps you, you are like Israel in darkness, not seeing things from a kingdom perspective. How can that change? Well, that's exactly what we're going to talk about in this study. So chapter 9, the Gospel of Matthew, and verse 27, we read here, And Yeshua, he departed from there. Two blind men followed him. So Yeshua is traveling, he is on the move, and, and two blind men encounter him. Now, it's very important that we see that these blind men and the emphasis of this first verse, verse 27, is these two blind men following him. It wasn't that Yeshua was pursuing them, but they, when they heard who was near, they followed after him. And notice what it says that they were doing. They were crying out and saying, now, the first word, this phrase, crying out, it shows desperation. And here's what we need to see. These two men, they were blind, but they were not foolish. They understood a foundational biblical principle. And what is that principle? We're going to see it in a moment. Because they were crying out, they were demonstrating their utmost dependence upon Messiah. And notice what they said. Be merciful to us. First and foremost, they recognize something. They recognize their absolute dependency, their need for the mercy of God. So let me ask you, do you recognize that need in your life for God's mercy? Without being a recipient of God's mercy, Nothing good from an eternal standpoint is going to happen 
in your life. Oh, you may have this happen that, that makes you happy, and something else that takes place may, might give you a temporal joy, but all those things are going to, to fade away. They're going to be done over and completed. And then what? No, we need to seek those things which have a kingdom consequence. That is an eternal outcome. And it's only then that we're going to be individuals that are going to be brought into intimacy with God. So mercy draws us close to God. And notice something else. These two individuals did just not cry out, be merciful to us. And hear this, to us. Why do I like that? Well, if I was probably there, I would say, God, be merciful to me. See, we tend to think of, first and foremost, ourselves. But a foundational truth in the Word of God is, love your neighbor as yourself. These men might have been blind. They may not have seen things physically, but they had some spiritual insight. And they said, be merciful to us. And notice how they address Yeshua. They called him son of David. Now, that term son of David derives from a covenantal promise that God made with King David concerning a son and offspring who would rule forever upon the throne of David. And therefore, these two blind men they had some spiritual insight. They recognized their need for mercy. And when we do that, we are going to make some good decisions. When we realize I'm in need of God's grace, His mercy, His forgiveness, His love, I'm ultimately dependent upon Him for all things. That is going to put us in a position where we can receive that spiritual enlightenment and know the truth. And what truth did they know? They knew that Yeshua, this, this Jesus of Nazareth, they knew that he was Messiah. So they cried out, have mercy, mercy, be merciful to us, son of David. Now, that is how this verse concludes, but look at the next verse, verse 28. Notice the lack of response of Yeshua. He does nothing. In fact, all it says here is that he departed into the house. And the word here that begins this verse is the word day, which shows a contrast. Yeshua did not respond according to what they had hoped. He didn't speak to them. He didn't respond. He didn't do anything. He just kept going to where he was going to his house. Now, for many people, that would have ended it. They would have said, well, I knew it. God doesn't love me. God doesn't care for me. That's why I'm in this predicament. This is why I'm blind. This is why I have this problem and this problem and nothing's going to change. Well, stop having a pity party. Understand that God, he's waiting for you to respond to him with spiritual insight. Now they began well. They sought his mercy. They recognized his identity and the mercy of God gives us spiritual insight. They recognized Yeshua as the son of David. But when he did not immediately respond, they didn't give up. But what did they do? They continued to follow. And how do we know this? Keep reading in verse 28. We read, the blind men came to him, and then Yeshua responded. And Yeshua said to them, Do you believe that I am able this to do? Now pay attention to the word order. He says, and I'm reading this very literally from the Greek text. It says here, He responds to these two blind men asking them, do you believe that I'm able this to do? And notice 
with confidence, with assurance, with a right spiritual perspective, recognizing his identity. Notice what they say. They say to him, yes. And here's what's interesting. There's a change. Throughout this, this passage, we see that Yeshua is called by name, by the author, Yeshua. When they address him the first time, they call him son of David, Messiah. And, and here's the lesson for us. Many times we are willing to relate to Yeshua as our Lord, as our Savior, as our God, and so forth. But here's the question. Are we willing to truly relate to him, not just by word, but by deed, recognizing his lordship? That's what we see here. They called him Lord, and we're going to see that they were individuals that did indeed want to serve him, submit to him. Once more, it is the mercy of God that gives us spiritual insight, that illumination, that revelation. It gives us a kingdom perspective whereby we can recognize the identity of Messiah and respond to him as we ought to. So Messiah says here, do you believe that I am able this to do? And they said, yes, Lord. And that term Lord gives us a very important truth concerning them. That they wanted healing in their life in order to serve him. So let me ask you a question. I'm sure that frequently you pray and you make your supplications, your requests known. But is your utmost desire why you want him to move in your life? Is so that you can demonstrate his lordship in your life by serving him, doing his will, participating in the work of God. This is what we're going to see about these two blind men. So they responded, yes, Lord, verse 29. Then, and this word tote in, in Greek speaks of an outcome. It's then, but as a result of this, then this took place. It was because of their desire for mercy, their recognition of his identity, their faith that all things are possible with God, and that Messiah is the anointed one of God, came to put things into order, and they wanted his order in their life, and they responded faithfully. And Messiah says to them in verse 29, he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, let it be done to you. Now, we see a relationship here between faith and the moving, the outcome, the provision of God in their life. Now, realize something. That does not mean, as some teach, if I have great faith, then I'm going to have great wealth. If I have great faith, then whatever I want, he's going to do. My wants are not related to faith. No, it is the will of God. And the point is this. When I demonstrate, act in faith, then what's going to happen? God is going to move mightily to bring his will into my life so that I can accomplish his purpose, do things from his point of view, and bring about what he desires. Here's the problem. All too often, individuals are more concerned with their desires than the desires of God. And their prayers, their beliefs, their so-called faith is all wrapped up in and motivated in me getting what I want. And then I'll thank God, I'll praise Him, and I'll respond, showing my, my gratitude. But that's not faith. That is not what we see the prophets teaching, Moses taught, or any of the apostles or Messiah himself. No spiritual truth, faith that pleases God, is always concerned with the things of God. So he touches their eyes and he says, let it be done to you as you 
believe according to what he says here, your faith. Look now to verse, verse 30. The eyes of theirs were open. So they received that, that miracle. Then their eyes were open. And notice what happens, middle of verse 30. He gave them a command. Now, this word means to, to instruct someone, to order someone, to charge, give a charge to someone of what they are called to do, like a, a superior soldier, an officer, would, would, would command a, a private in the army. And notice that this is something that we see so frequently in the Scriptures, and this is what I'm talking about. In the Bible, when God moves in someone's life, when they receive an answer to their prayers, whatever it might be, almost without exception, what happens is this. The next thing is God commands them to see if they're going to be obedient. So realize, when God moves in my life, when God does something in your life, you need to respond to that by expecting orders from the king. Instruction on what to do, and you ought to do just that. When God moves in your life, when you are a recipient of his mercy, of his spiritual illumination, of his provision, whatever it might be, it is to produce obedience in your life to the things of God. So we read that he commanded them, instructed them, gave them a charge to do something. And what was that? He instructed them, that is Yeshua, saying, see, no one knows this. See to it that no one, make this known to no one. Now, why would that be? Well, to answer this question, we have to go back up to an earlier verse, the first verse that we began with tonight, verse 27. When we read here that these two men responded to Yeshua, to the Lord, as son of David. Now, we have studied before that according to Jewish backgrounds, that, that Judaism taught, and this is incorrect, that there's two messiahs. We know the truth. There is one Messiah that comes twice and has two distinct, related but distinct works. And when we talk about his first coming, he's that suffering servant. And in Judaism, we, we think of him, call him Messiah, the son of Joseph. Why? Joseph went down to Egypt, he suffered, and his brethren did not recognize him. And then when Messiah returns, when he comes the second time, in order to set up the kingdom, he's coming as king. Now, he's always the king of kings, lord of lords, but he came the first time humbly. But when he comes the second time, he's coming to bring judgment, and that judgment will put things in order to establish the kingdom, where he's the king of that kingdom. And here's the problem. Messiah, after healing these two blind men, see, healing of the blind, that was, and don't miss this, that was a prophetic sign of his messianic identity. And he knew that by and large, the Jewish community, they were only expecting a ruling king. They were looking for the son of David to deliver them from Roman occupation, that evil empire. That's not why Messiah came the first time. He came to die upon that tree, to, to pay the price for, for your sins and my sins, that we might be set free from the bondage of sin so that we can walk in obedience with his will. And he was teaching this. So they knew him as son of David. And he says, don't let anyone know this. Literally, see to it that no one, nothing concerning this, be being known to anyone. But look at verse 31. What did they do? Now, the scripture is telling us something. Not that these are 
disobedient ones. But they, based upon what he had done in their life, they were not able to contain it. They just had to tell them. And we see many examples of this in the scriptures, in the gospels, where Messiah says, shh, don't let anyone know I'm the son of David. Why? He's come to do the work of the son of Joseph, Messiah, the son of Joseph, to lay down his life, not to establish that kingdom 2,000 years ago. That's what he's coming back to do. So he says, shh. But they could not contain themselves. They just had to tell everyone what he had done for their life. Look at verse 31. We read here. But, that's that word in contrast to, but they went out making known him. And that's emphatic. They were making people aware of him. And notice what it says, in all that land. Now, they had some ministry, did they not? They were telling everyone about him. They weren't pointing to themselves. These were not prideful individuals that said, you know, God loved me so much that he healed me. God, God wants to do great things in my life more than others, and that's why he did this spectacular miracle. No, they made people know of him. And this tells us simply of the natural outcome from receiving a touch from the Lord, a healing touch. And I'm speaking about salvation, that mercy, that forgiveness of sins. If you really have experienced that, you can't help but make that known to others, not just in your home or in your small community, but notice they did so throughout the land. Now let's move on to verse, verse 32. We read that they went out, meaning they, him, and the disciples, they went out from that place. Behold, important word, behold, they brought to him a man who was a mute, meaning he couldn't speak and he couldn't hear. And why couldn't he speak or hear? Why was he a mute? Very simply, because he was demon-possessed. And notice immediately what the scripture says. This one who was demon-possessed, we find that, verse 33, and casting out the demon, this mute, he spoke, and all the crowds. Now, it's not just speaking about a few people or one crowd, but it's in the plural. All the crowds. There was this great number of people. And what we're supposed to conclude is this. Those two blind men, they told everyone, and people from all about came, and they knew something. If he's really Messiah, he's just not going to heal the blind, but the deaf and many others. He's going to cause the lame to leap, and he's going to set the captives free. All of these messianic prophecy. So here in this text, we read that he cast out the demon, this mute. He began to speak, and the crowds marveled, saying, never. And this next word speaks about a manifestation. Never has there been a manifestation thus in Israel. Now, here's the important word. This word for manifestation, it is a word that speaks about something appearing, something being visible. Remember the context. We began with two blind men. And now these two blind men see. Now this deaf mute, he speaks. And the, crew, the crowds were amazed. They marveled because nothing like this in Israel had ever been done. Pretty convincing proof. Well, these two blind men, they were blind, but now they saw. But we're going to meet a group of people that they could see physically, but they were spiritually blind. And who's that? Look now to verse 34. But all the crowds marveled, but in contrast to that, 
the Pharisees were saying, by the prince of the demons, he cast out demons. And why say this? Simply because they did not want to serve God. They were not interested in spiritual truth. They were interested in participating in the things of God. Why? Because they were spiritually blind. And when you are spiritually blind, the things of God, you're not going to be interested in. In fact, you will speak against them. Move on now to verse, verse 35. And Yeshua went about all the cities and villages teaching, teaching, giving revelation, bringing spiritual illumination, teaching in their synagogues. And what was he doing? The scripture says he was proclaiming, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And he healed all the sick, every sickness and every disease among the people. And behold, it says, seeing the crowd, he had mercy concerning them because they were worn out. They were driven, meaning they weren't where they ought to be. They were removed from the proper place because they were as sheep having no shepherd. And that's what's so sad. Remember, the emphasis here is about Israel. We're going to see clearly in the word of God that that Messiah, in a unique way, came to minister to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And under the leadership of the Pharisees, the people, Israel, they were like a sheep. Sheep that were worn out, that were driven into the wrong pastor, into a place of danger. And they went there. Why? Well, because they were led by themselves. They had no shepherd. And may I say to you that if Yeshua is not the Lord of your life, you are going to be spiritually blind. You are not going to make kingdom decisions. And you are going to be spiritually worn out, defeated, you are going to be in a person, be in a position where you're not going to be where God wants you to be. And therefore, you will not be able to do the things that God would have you to do. Be spiritually wise. Have that spiritual illumination. See things from a kingdom perspective. Submit to the truth of God. And you're going to be amazed at how God moves and leads you to good pastors where he will truly manifest his leadership in your life. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.